Hey everybody, I guess uh, we're back. We're back to record another video. After we saying this was gonna be our final of faults, there's been so much shit that's happened in the last month. We kind of figured we'd yeah make another video and hope not be as long as this this time, but just uh, yeah. Exactly. Last time we went up to almost an hour, and uh, yeah, we're gonna hit just a few notes in the aftermath of uh, leaving Neverland airing in the UK. Yeah. By the way, everybody, thanks for watching the first one. And uh, like I said, we'll probably yeah we'll get into the habit of doing more kind of YouTube rants and ramblings. Yes, absolutely. Our first video, um, the breaking down the narrative of leaving Neverland, has we released that about three weeks ago, and it's had over over five hundred views, um, which is fantastic. I just want to th yeah, like you said, thanks, yeah. thank everyone like, who I watched it. I thought there'd be about fifty at best. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, it was very uh, therapeutic for us, to say the least. Yeah. Um, we got a lot off our chest and we felt a lot better afterwards. And in the weeks that followed, we felt even better because when we released that video, it was in reaction to the UK airing of Leaving Neverland. Since then, it has gone on to air in um, Europe and many other countries. Mm -hmm. has, it, has it aired in Australia yet? It has, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty much shared everywhere around the world. And uh, with the Blu-ray to be released in Amazon... Oh, actually, no, wait, it's not, is it? That's right. The <laughs> that's right, the Blu-ray. Striking while the iron is uh, relatively ice cold. They yeah. stuck the uh, Amazon, they stuck it up on Amazon, the Blu-ray uh, pre-order link and for the DVD, but now it's mysteriously no longer available. But were you not like dying to see that? I mean, like how many people would just love to watch a film, like four hour film about freaking child's molestation? Like, I mean, that's just, yeah, that would be just my cup of tea, you know? Yeah, I'm still struggling to figure out who the target market is or was for that one. <laughs> see, Michael Jackson fans are obviously not going to watch it because it's basically four hours of slandering, you know, their favorite artist. Um, non Michael Jackson fans, unless they're really fucking sick in the head, you know, yeah, why? Why was that even proposed as a potential DVD release? Oh, it dear. Absolutely baffles me. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, even someone who's inclined to believe is guilty, why would they want to own that for repeated viewing? It's yeah. insane. So like, yeah, let's have a nice night in front of the fire, watch Leaving Neverland. Oh, yeah, it's just like... <laughs> Quite honestly, the only person I could see really enjoying it might be Victor Gutierrez or people of his inclination of thinking. But yeah, that's enough about that. Uh, it has also come to light that um, there was 17 months between the wrapping up of the initial filming and the extra footage that they shot in which Jimmy Safechuck presented a ring. Mm -hmm. no, no proof to show that this is Michael's ring, no receipts, not even a copy of the vows that he alleged that they filled in, which would have been far more damaging. No, he just presents a ring. And as we discussed in the first video, like it was in a very beautiful presentation box. Mm. So if he didn't like the jewelry, and that's a quote <laughs> from the from the film, mm. I don't like the jewelry. Um, why would he keep it? And why would he keep it in such a beautiful presentation box? Even, that doesn't yeah. make sense to me. I mean, even if it was like a visually beautiful piece of jewelry, you wouldn't fucking keep that. Like not, you know, this is like a reminder of this abuse that you've gone through. And furthermore, despite the vows, if those vows were lying around Neverland Ranch, you can bet that they would have been bloody well found when Neverland Ranch was raided in 1993 and yeah. 2003, 2004. And for all the haters would say, oh, well, he would have been given a heads up and he would have hid all that stuff. Well, these were surprise raids. Yeah. There was no heads up. And in fact, uh, if I, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, on both occasions, Michael wasn't even in the building when it happened. Yeah, he was off each proper, time. Yeah, both times. And furthermore, the FBI, I believe, also did one or two kind of surprise raids. They, you know, bugged his phone or whatever and nothing incriminating. Even, you know, even if it was like something as small that would even provide an alibi to these accusers. Like, for example, say the train station was actually there. If, you know, CCTV cameras all over that ranch, Michael's niece's brandy has confirmed that. If, if Michael was actually abusing some kids, like if there was any sort of alibi, that would have been on the CCTV. You know, the FBI, the LAPD would have found that and gone, right, well, he did say in December 1991 that he went up to the train station to Michael. Oh, look, there's CCTV footage, footage of them walking into the train station, just them together, and they don't emerge again for another hour. You know, that would be, that would have been fucking submitted in court. 
Absolutely. I mean, this, you have to remember that uh, Tom Sneddon was a man obsessed. And if there was anything remote that could remotely be even twisted, yeah, then that would have been used. I mean, he fucking used the narrative in 2005 that the Arvizo family were shipped off to well, like Brazil or somewhere to make a freaking video of, and all this nonsense, like a perfectly scripted video about this abuse that hadn't actually been done yet. And, you know, it's harping on about like a bloody hot air balloon. It was like something out of that Pixar movie up. <laughs> Minus the talking dog, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's timeline discrepancies is a very common thread with all these uh, allegations. So the reason we know that there's 17 months between filming is because the Airbnb reviews left by Dan Reed himself for the property in which they filmed the interviews mm -hmm. the first one was in february 2017 yeah the second one was in <clears throat> july 2018 and you can even check in mm -hmm. the, uh, the actual footage itself the furniture is different the time of day is different what at one point it's bright outside the next point it's dark outside you pair that on top of the fact that between the us and the uk airing so much stuff had already been discredited mm -hmm. that 48 minutes had been cut from the original content that's 20 percent yeah so how any rational thinking person even if they were convinced of michael's guilt how any rational person can not ask questions mm -hmm. of this is really beyond me how people can blindly believe this yeah is really beyond Absolutely. me i mean if and if they were going to film 17 months apart you think they would make the effort to have the backgrounds <laughs> yeah. and that the surroundings would exactly be mm. the same you know yeah i mean like as a filmmaker the golden rule about making a film is continuity you know you don't change the furniture around or you know at least i'll say at least one thing he had like him wearing the same clothes so it was obviously a very pathetic attempt to keep the continuity but i mean the lighting everything was different and i have seen a few fans say that oh a few videos were made saying that uh the um Oh yeah, well, it was obviously filmed over a few days. I mean, that's, well, not reasonable, but you know. Uh, but to have it like completely changed, yeah, furniture blatantly changed. He would have been best filming um, James in his house. Yeah, I mean, you'd think more care would have been taken <laughs> yeah. to make sure that the background and everything was as close to exactly the same as yeah. possible. But again, that was a... That was debunked by uh, Pez Dan in a tweet he sent out, I believe, mm -hmm. this morning. Yeah, so I say thank you, Pez. He's, uh, if you're on Twitter, you should follow him. He's a very good MG advocate. Um, very entertaining tweets <laughs> this yeah. morning. After the US, where uh, Leaving Neverland was given uh, relatively positive media reviews, uh, things started to fall apart for uh, Dan Reed once he crossed the Atlantic. It's well documented that he got grilled by Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain. <laughs> But uh, when it premiered on French TV and Dan Reed was uh, in a debate panel with um, several people, a psychologist, a uh, Michael Jackson fan. Yeah, he really, he really got grilled about that mm. one. Uh, and he was like, I was okay, I was impressed. Wow, you can speak French. But yeah, that's not really helping your argument right now. Because uh, he was completely, I mean, he was just digging a deeper hole for himself. He didn't really have an answer to give, did he? No, and you can watch it for yourself. We'll put the link in the yeah. description below if you want to. But uh, yeah. one of the standout things for me, and I can't believe not many others have picked up on it, but he essentially, in his view, on live recorded TV, he implicated uh, Michael Jackson fans in being complicit in the covering up of child sex abuse, stating that uh, potential victims are only afraid to come forward because they will be bullied by the fan community. Pas facile pour les enfants, de, surtout avec la pression et toute la haine qui vient des, des, des fans, mais pas vous, de, 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 de Michael Jackson. Euh, C'est très difficile de se révéler parce qu'il bon, est difficile, vous allez le confirmer, pour, pour les, les, les victimes ordinaires de se révéler. Mais quand il s'agit de Michael Jackson et que tout ça va vous tomber dessus. Je pense que c'était une chose vraiment dead thing pour lui dire. Et quand les semaines se sont passées, il était évident que il uh, he came out with a lot of knee-jerk reactions. The picture that Dan Reed has been wanting to paint of mm -hmm. Michael Jackson fans from the beginning is that they are irrational, they are hate-filled. And we touched on this briefly in our first video mm -hmm. in the footage of the fans that were shown on Leaving Neverland. Yeah. They were very fanatical, they were very 
they came across as very irrational. You had yeah. one guy just yelling F you Wade over and over again. It was just he had a very clear narrative that he wanted to stick to. Mm -hmm. The more he can classify the fans as being, for want of a better term, lunatics or nutcases, the easier it is for them to be dismissed. It's it's a typical fallacy. Yeah. I mean, if you can't properly debate or tackle the issue, mm -hmm. you try and discredit the source. So Oh, why would you listen to them? They're pedophile apologists. Or why would you listen to them? They're f blinded by their fanatical love of Michael Jackson. Yeah, for him to say that on fucking television and pl imply that we are basically aiding and abetting child abuse is just really, it's an offensive and dangerous thing to say, in my view. It is, and his behavior on Twitter has been no better. I mean, he's been pulling the old tweet and delete tactic for the yeah. last while now. And it, it's blatantly obvious to me that he's feeding off of this negative response mm. and i think we've all present company included been guilty of directly tweeting him and venting our mm. frustrations or our criticisms uh, although i do think the best way <coughs> forward now is to not engage with him on twitter no. at all he said egg, egg on you. He said egg. If I said egg, stop saying egg. Egg, egg. He said egg again. Uh, Dan Reed, just to uh, going back to his behavior on Twitter, supposedly changed the avatar on his Twitter accounts to that of a uh, young um, topless Michael Jackson surrounded by topless boys. Now, looks so bad. <laughs> it does look bad, but it changed back pretty quickly. But there are um, theories going around. I don't know how true they are that Dan Reed actually has a troll Michael Jackson hate Twitter account. Mm -hmm. First, I will say that just to add context to the photo, like I said, it looks really bad, but apparently it was taken, it must have been, I think it was like the mid to late 80s. Yeah. He, they were at a, like a family party, it was like down a swimming pool. And uh, some of the kids, there's actually several photos taken that day. They're with women, with men, with children, male and female. So of course, Obviously, the people who believe Michael is a pedophile are going to use that photo of the one photo that happens to be him with a bunch of preteen boys. <laughs> it does, it does yeah. look, you know, it looks really fucking bad. But uh, out of context, it does. Out look of context, bad, yes. yeah. So just give some context, context into that. Um, yeah, context topic. is king with these things. I'm sure many of you watching this are aware of the whole train <laughs> station timeline discrepancy. So, um, yeah, it has always been. Jimmy Safe Chuck's timeline. This is probably the one part of a story that he has been consistent with. Mm. That the abuse he alleges he suffered happened between the years of nineteen eighty eight and nineteen ninety two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's always he's always said that. I mean, he said I've heard it was a quote until I was about I was abused until I was about fourteen. And in Leaving Neverland, he specifically states when listing off all the places they allegedly had sex. Again, we have thoughts on that on the first video. Uh, one of the places he specifically states is the train station at Neverland. Mm -hmm. Now, one problem about that. Well, as you probably all know by now, the train station didn't exist uh, in 1992 when the alleged abuse stopped. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, so Mike Smallcomb, uh, a biographer for Michael Jackson, uh, did some uh, detective work and he was able to obtain from the Santa Barbara County yeah. planning permission for this train station. Mm. The permit was only granted in September of 1993, mm. which means it could not have been even built until well into 1994. Yeah. Well, Two years yeah. after he alleges the abuse ended. Yeah, well, I will, I will say, you know, like I've seen one or two haters kind of say, oh, well, you know, a lot of the time people build buildings and then ask for planning permission afterwards. They don't do that all, that often. I work in the industry. Like, it's always quite a risky thing because, of course, if the council or whatever discover that you have built the building that you're seeking planning permission for already, they can pretty much order it to be knocked down. So I don't think that's very likely. And on top of that, as far as I'm aware, there are no existing photographs of the Neverland train station prior to 94. Yeah, I mean, so this this uh, timeline discrepancy marks, by my count, the second time that the uh, Jimmy Safechuck, mm -hmm. or the Safechuck family in general, yeah. have traveled through time. And another one um, worth mentioning is that um, Jim Safechuck in Leaving Neverland also alleges that Michael bought Neverland for him. Yeah. He also alleges that the sexual abuse didn't start until 1988, 
Michael Jackson made the down payment on Neverland in 1987, a year before. Yeah. So that can't have been true either. No, it can't have been. Basically, he's trying to expect us to believe that Michael decided to buy this ranch based on having a crush on a kid he'd literally just met. You know, like you don't meet somebody and go, yeah, you're pretty sexy. I'm just going to buy a massive big ranch for you so I can like have sex with you everywhere around it. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, that makes no sense. <laughs> Yeah, and this has forced Dan Reed into a very tough position and he's backed himself into a corner here because with this timeline, Dan Reed could either admit that the timeline presented in Leaving Neverland is factually incorrect Mm -hmm. or the second option, which is the one he went for, he publicly came out and stated that there was no doubt over the dates of the train station what they got wrong was when the abuse ended. So he essentially threw James Safechuck under the bus by stating that one constant part of his story was incorrect. You mean under the train? Under the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... Because um... he has maintained that, including in his most recent deposition, that mm-hmm. the abuse ended in 1992 when he was 14 years old. His uh, multiple statements uh, of his time as the one thing he has been consistent about. He's always said, tell from when I was 10 till I was around 14, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I was abusing the train station. It all stopped in 1992. And then he, I got replaced by, you know, was it? Brett Barnes. Brett Barnes, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's a, kind of that whole theory out the window. Yeah, Dan Reed is staking his entire reputation on leaving Neverland and as such... He he's in a situation where he has to defend it. Yeah. Even if that means yeah. damaging his co-star's appeal of the lawsuit, which is still ongoing. Yeah, and like that's what I keep saying to people. Like I said, to play devil's advocate, if if the, we had, uh, Robson and James Safeshock were telling the truth, and they really were molested, then Dan Reed is really, really like abusing them. Mm-hmm. he's um he's completely manipulating them he is yeah exploiting them big time you yeah. know because if he really care if they were really abused if he really that's maybe it makes me think as well that he doesn't actually believe they're abused either or he doesn't care whether or not they were abused because if they were really abused and he's like throwing like safe truck under the train under the bus whatever with all his kind of you know his timeline or whatever that's yeah that's um like that's pretty bad like you know would you if you really believed that somebody had been abused you care about them you would you wouldn't do that exactly yeah yeah if dan reed cares about victims as much as he claims he does then he would not have deliberately derailed the timeline of no. jim jimmy safe and he certainly wouldn't be sparking the harassment that brett barnes has faced brett barnes yeah. asked for his name to be removed from the movie mm-hmm that didn't happen and now he's being harassed oh be, oh no you're a victim you just mm. don't know it you're a victim you just don't know it it's almost mm. as you want to talk about conditioning dan reed keeps saying that brett barnes is a victim he just needs to come forward he just doesn't know it yet he's repeating an assertion and the repetition of an assertion until it becomes a belief yeah. is like the textbook definition of conditioning so yeah. who's really being groomed here that's the thing like if yeah if they're actually being abused he is really exploiting them. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I really baffles me is why like people who believe Michael was guilty support Dan Reed and s- sing his praises. Because if I believe Michael was guilty, I would sure as hell not be supporting Dan Reed right now because he has completely destroyed their chances of appealing their lawsuit. And he's made them look like liars. He's made them into some sort of entertainment vessel, like some sort of crowning glory for himself. You see, like... I've seen Safe Chuck and Robson have actually backed away from doing public interviews, but I've like in the past I've seen them like on TV interviews, like they're sitting there with their, you know, kind of looking a little bit guilty. But he like throughout, no matter what they're talking about, you see him standing beside them with a big smirk on his face. You know, like that's that is not supporting victims or alleged victims, like genuine or not. That's not supporting sex abuse victims, and I it's absolutely disgusting. It's my personal belief. He doesn't believe that. Wayne and um, Jimmy were molested. I really don't think it. I think he, as a filmmaker, he is proud of his work. It's his baby. He's put so much, believe it or not, work into it. Um, so he wants to protect his work. He wants to defend what he's did. You know, and he's kind of dug himself into this rut where he can't get out of it. The only thing is to do is fucking blindly defend it 
And then accuse people who disagree with him of being lunatics. Yesterday I uh, put on a bet on the Grand National and I said I took the Dan Reed approach. I did little or no research into it and I put all my money on the wrong horse. And like all this and more has really caused a sea change, especially in the media. This is something I was very surprised by that the UK and now even slowly the US media are really starting to pick up on these details mm-hmm. uh, whereas they mightn't have done before. Yep. So I think that's a very very uh, positive um very positive move forward, I think. Yeah. I mean there was a uh, <clears throat> in the lead up to leaving Neverland there was this real great fear, this sense of looming dread. Yeah. that this would pardon the pun, that this is it. Mm. This could be the end of Michael's legacy. However, there is definitely a sea change happening. A lot of radio stations who had initially banned his music mm. have started playing him again. I think like, even the ones who are still outright banning, I think it's going to eventually sneak in. Like It might be a few years' time, but you know... I think like they are definitely going to uh, it's gonna it's gonna eventually he's gonna sneak back into their way soon. On Joe.ie there's a um some but it was commenting they posted a link once again about um another MJ advocate, Liam McEwen, had made mm-hmm. a short film on YouTube. You should check it out. Uh, an interview with Michael's family in it. Mm-hmm. And that's been very widely shared as well. And uh, I did see some girls in the comments and Joe.ie going, oh, this is good. Wow, I feel like I can actually listen to his music again now. <laughs> I suppose at this point, it's just want to just give sh- uh, some shout outs to other um, people who have done great work in terms of defending MJ or bringing out rebuttals in this tough time. Mm-hmm. I mean, first and foremost, the MJ cast yeah. have been amazing. A link to their most recent episode below. And of course, Charles Thompson, who has mm-hmm. been absolutely incredible. He's been going on radio shows across the world, essentially. Yeah. And he was also took part. He also took part in that uh, Liam McEwen documentary. Yeah. Um, also, if you haven't checked them out, Razor Fists is very His good. Videos are hilarious. They're very funny. They're very well informed. He actually mm-hmm. he done a couple of debunking videos about Michael Jackson, and in response to leaving Neverland, he also interviewed Taj and Brandy Jackson. Very good interview. Very good. Very highly recommended. Sandy, this is really fucking gratifying. Mm-hmm. I have a real like told you so moments. Uh, to actually for the first time, the media are maybe beginning to listen to fans and go, well, hang on a second, they actually. Some of them maybe not completely insane. They maybe actually might know what they're talking about here. Um, they've pointed out some completely irrefutable proofs and truths and whatever. Um, so I mean, it's great that for once that we're not just all being called lunatics because we disagree with the main narrative, the narrative that the media wants you to believe. Now the media actually want you to believe us. So it's it is thank you'd like to thank the media for <laughs> going both ways. Yes, there are a lot of crazy Michael Jackson fans, but there's also a lot of them who could they could they could bloody teach you the law. Like they know what we know a lot about the legal system in the US and the UK. We have a lot of like forensic knowledge of the case. And we are objective and we take it so seriously because we we don't want to put our reputation on the line. You know, like I hear a lot of people say, Oh, Michael Jackson's music's great, but he was such a pedophile. I would not be listening to his music if I thought for one second that he was a pedophile. I don't care if his music was well, like the greatest in the world. And to say that, oh, you're just biased, you're just you know deluded, you're just a lunatic, you're in denial because you like his music. That is really simplistic and insulting. And I'd really like people to think about that. People who know me, that I would not be sitting here like an idiot on YouTube defending somebody I fought for one second to be guilty of any sort of sex crime. As I've always said, if you want to look for evidence that Michael Jackson is innocent, try and look for evidence that he's guilty. It's like we now live in the age of the internet. Information is like readily available to us at all times. Mm -hmm. So in this day and age, there's no real excuse for ignorance unless it's willful. Yeah, if you can sit and watch a four-hour documentary, two guys talking, you can take a few, I'm sure, even one hour to research the allegations. And I'm not talking about going on, like, reading a few old Radar Online or TMZ articles. I'm talking about actually going reading the FBI files, reading the court transcript. We've listed below many sources of very good information that are factually proven. 
um, there's no excuse. Yeah, the documents are out there. I mean, it's there in black and white. It's why would the FBI lie? Why would the coroner lie? Mm-hmm. Why would the Santa Barbara County lie? Yeah. I mean, the timeline simply does not fit. It's as yeah. simple as that. This movie has <clears throat> been disproven. It has been discredited. It's been chopped and changed. And as we mentioned earlier on, the Blu-ray release is now magically no, no longer available on Amazon. And I'm sure that's nothing to do with the fact that their drone footage wasn't even their own drone footage. Yeah. It was stolen from the realtor, who that's, is now looking yeah. to take legal action. Oops. That's, yeah, that's another thing. Like, that was just, that was so hurriedly made. I think Dan was just really pushing for it, wanting the controversy, wanting the recognition. And he just thought it would be quite an easy documentary to make. I had to sit these guys down, talk, let them talk for a few hours come back 17 months later, let them talk for another while and we'll just stick some splice and drone, drone footage in. Like that's, yeah, come on, dude. You should at least buy your own drone and fly it around. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think for a second that he expected this kind of scrutiny to be applied no. to leaving Neverland. I think, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the train station tweet, he, he tweeted that admitting, acknowledging that the timeline was up the left, it was flawed, but he... Once he'd said that, he probably knew there'd be hundreds of fans screen capping him. Mm-hmm. So he could not delete that. He would have made himself look even worse by deleting that tweet. Mm-hmm. You know, it could have been like, oh, you're something to hide. So I think he took the ch- the stance of, oh, no, let's just be strong. Let's just stand what I've, what I've said. But I'll just waffle on about, oh, yeah, Jimmy's confused, you know, confused abuse victim. Got dates a bit confused. Which I will mention, you know, like, yeah, okay, I acknowledge that, you know, obviously victims do get confused and maybe don't remember exact places and times, but it's usually like you're talking like a six month, a year discrepancy, not like two years. And I'm sure if Jim Sifchuk was a real victim, he would have looked into this before he made his statements. Mm -hmm. He'd have said, right, my abuse ended in 1992. As far as I remember, I need to stick with this. But now, yeah... James has been forced to change his timeline completely. Yeah. His haters will say, oh, well, you weren't in the room. How do you know? Well, fuck, apparently the room wasn't there either. So train, train station's there case. You, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I mean, going back to send the typical argument that haters always seem to present, that it seems to me that they don't often, more often than not, don't have a huge lot of knowledge of the case. There's always two main ones. The first one is, oh, but he paid them off $20 million. The second one is always... Oh, but, but, but he slept in beds of all these boys. Like, how can you defend that? Like, well, I'll address the hush money thing first. Firstly, that was not what happened. There was actually no hush money. It was not paid off. It was a result of a Californian bylaw at the time that as a result of that case, uh, the law actually got changed. So no other person can end up in Michael's position. That position being that at the time, a civil trial could take place before the criminal trial yeah tom snedden for anybody who doesn't know he was the uh district attorney for uh, santa barbara county and he was also the pros so he was a prosecutor in the michael jackson both the trial and the 1993 allegations he would have also been the prosecution had that 1993 case gone to trial which it couldn't because he tried to get two grand juries in two separate counties to indict michael and none of them, they both refused to indict him on the ground that there was no evidence. And as a side note, there's always that whole thing about the boy, you know, he correctly identified Michael's genitalia. No, he didn't because the genitalia, the photographs, the drawings was actually not admitted by, or submitted, sorry, by the prosecution in their indictments. If there had been any sort of evidence that that description was consistent, it would have been in there, sorry. <laughs> Yes, and the coroner's report also confirmed that Michael Jackson's penis was not circumcised. Jordy Chandler's description was that of a circumcised penis. Yeah, so that was that set out the window. And the second argument, of course, is, oh, but he's sat in the beds of all these boys, so how can you defend that? First, I'm not going to defend that. That's completely inappropriate. However, I always say to people, context is the key here. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at the amount, like literally dozens, hundreds of people, even as recently Karen Fay, Michael's makeup artist, um, wrote a post on social media just saying like how often she would be, you know, Michael would go, the kids would be hanging out with him in Neverland. They were often family friends or actual nieces, nephews, cousins of his. They would all just be sitting in his bedroom, which by the way, it's been well documented that Michael's bedroom was the size of like a two-story house. 
bigger than most people's homes. A huge big penthouse with multiple beds, multiple bathrooms. So often the current face said there'd be she'd go in there, it'd be like kids, adults, whatever in the room, and often the kids would have fallen asleep watching TV, fallen asleep on the couch or on the floor, or in the bed, and you know, then Michael's hair Karen would walk in and Michael would go on, go back into the studio while the kids slept upstairs in his penthouse bedroom or whatever. And they'd just fall asleep. He didn't want to disturb them. Um, also, it's been well documented that Michael never actually asked the kids to sleep in the bedroom with him. He always asked the parents. And also, it's been well documented. He never sh- actually slept in the bed with them. In fact, the 2005 accuser, Gavin Arviso, actually explicitly said under oath that he never actually shared the same bed as Michael Jackson. He slept in Michael's bed, Michael slept on the floor, and Michael's personal assistant, Frank Cassio, also uh, was willing to testify that he was in the room with the this boy and Michael each time, and he slept on the floor with Michael, and the, the boy and his brother slept in the bed. And of course, in a strategic move by the uh, district attorney, Frank Cassio was precluded from testifying as the actual case was the state of Santa Barbara versus Michael Jackson and undisclosed conspirators. Frank Cassio was one of those conspirators. So, and as a result, he was, he was unable to testify to that effect. Yeah. So that was basically like the, the prosecution basically destroyed Michael's alibi to say that he was never left in a room on his own with this, this child. And they also changed the law, Tom Sned, on uh, spearheaded the 1108 previous bad acts, I believe it's called, in which uh, evidence from previous allegations, previous similar allegations, would be allowed into the case. And that's what happened here. So <clears throat> essentially, in the 2005 trial, he was found not guilty on 14 separate counts. Four of them were misdemeanors. And they covered not only the 2005 allegations, but also the 1993 allegations. He was exonerated on both. Mm -hmm. Like I said, well, I will not defend him sharing the bed with children. You do have to take it into context. And yes, people also said, oh, Michael Jackson was, you know, some regular guy down the street. The police would be called. Yeah, well, definitely. But also the regular guy down the street wouldn't have like a hundred sheriffs to send on his home and search. (laughs) The regular guy down the street would not have the trial by media that Michael Jackson had. So, I mean, there's really no comparison. Michael Jackson was not a regular guy. Mm-hmm, exactly. And that doesn't exclude him if, from the law. If It doesn't make not make him above the law if he had done anything wrong. But the evidence is there, or the lack of evidence is there, that there was simply no evidence that he did anything wrong. Another response, of course, from haters would be, oh, well, you say nothing was found during the raids. They actually found child pornography. Oh, they did not yeah if you actually look at the 14 charges not one of them was possession of child pornography it doesn't matter if you're the guy down the street or you're the biggest selling recording artist of all time in either to either person the possession of child pornography is illegal illegal and if anything remotely pornographic as it relates to children was found he would have been charged with it he was not Yeah, I suppose to end on a positive note, I would like to actually thank Dan Reed because of him, I now know that the French for flop is flop. Yes. So, knowledge is power. On that note, Godspeed. (laughs) And... (laughs) You want to get sued? Oh, yeah. Well, sorry. On that note, I hope you all have a good day. We are going out to the beach and then to the pub because it's... I might might leave that Godspeed in there. That was funny. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Beach, pub or Godspeed, either way.